Hi, and welcome to our video on the management of shock in the emergency department. In this video, we'll be discussing what shock is, its causes, and the management of patients with shock in the emergency department. First of all, what is shock? Shock is a life-threatening condition that occurs when the body's vital organs do not receive enough blood and oxygen to function properly. Shock can be caused by a variety of factors, including severe bleeding, dehydration, a heart attack, or infection. The signs and symptoms of shock can vary depending on the cause, but some common signs include low blood pressure, rapid heart rate, decreased urine output, and altered mental status. If you suspect that someone is in shock, it's important to act quickly and seek medical attention. Now, let's understand the primary management of shock. The management of shock in the emergency department depends on the cause and severity of the condition. However, there are some general steps that can be taken to manage shock. Step 1. Rapid Assessment The first step in managing shock is to rapidly assess the patient's vital signs and identify any underlying causes of the condition. Next, airway management. Ensure that the patient's airway is open and maintain proper ventilation. Step 3. Fluid resuscitation. Patients with shock often require fluid resuscitation to increase blood pressure and restore blood volume. The type and amount of fluid administered depend on the cause of the shock. Next, medications. Some medications may be administered to help increase blood pressure and improve cardiac function. Next, blood transfusion. In cases of severe bleeding, blood transfusion may be necessary to restore blood volume. Lastly, definitive treatment. Once the patient is stabilized, definitive treatment for the underlying cause of shock should be administered. Let's start with the assessment of shock in the emergency room. When a patient arrives in the emergency room, the first step is to assess the patient's vital signs, including blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. These vital signs provide important clues about the patient's condition and whether they are in shock. Healthcare professionals will also ask the patient about their symptoms and medical history. They present with low blood pressure, normally below 90 systolic, and tachycardia with a heart rate of more than 100 per minute. Next, healthcare professionals will perform a physical exam to look for signs of shock. There are normally four primary signs of shock we need to look for in the emergency room. These includes cold clammy skin, a rapid heart rate, low blood pressure, and an altered mental status. Additionally, healthcare professionals will assess the patient's urine output, which can be an indicator of how well the kidneys are functioning. Once shock is suspected, healthcare professionals will perform additional tests to identify the underlying cause of shock. These tests may include blood tests, such as a complete blood count and electrolyte panel, imaging tests, such as a chest x-ray or ultrasound, and other diagnostic tests, depending on the suspected cause of shock. Shock is a critical medical condition that requires prompt recognition and treatment, and airway management is a crucial component of shock management. So, let's dive in and learn how healthcare professionals manage the airway in patients in shock. Firstly, let's define what we mean by airway management. Airway management refers to the process of ensuring a patient's airway is open and able to support ventilation. In patients in shock, airway management can be challenging due to the potential for compromised respiratory function. When a patient arrives in the emergency room in shock, healthcare professionals will assess their airway, breathing, and circulation. If the patient's airway is compromised, healthcare professionals may need to intervene to ensure adequate oxygenation and ventilation. The first step in airway management in a shock patient is to provide supplemental oxygen through a non-rebreather mask or other oxygen delivery device. If the patient's oxygen saturation levels do not improve with supplemental oxygen, Healthcare professionals may need to consider more advanced airway management techniques. One such technique is the placement of an endotracheal tube. An ETT is a tube that is inserted through the mouth or nose and into the trachea to provide a patent airway. However, in patients in shock, the placement of an ETT can be challenging due to the potential for hypotension and decreased cardiac output. In these cases, healthcare professionals may need to consider alternative airway management techniques such as a supraglottic airway device or a cricothyrotomy. 
An SGA is a device that is inserted through the mouth and sits above the glottis to provide a patent airway, while a cricothyrotomy involves making an incision in the neck and inserting a tube directly into the trachea. It's important to note that airway management in shock patients should be performed by trained healthcare professionals in a controlled setting. Improper airway management can lead to complications, such as hypoxia, hypotension, and cardiac arrest. Next, fluid resuscitation. Firstly, let's define what we mean by fluid resuscitation. Fluid resuscitation refers to the administration of fluids to restore circulating blood volume and improve tissue perfusion. The goal of fluid resuscitation is to improve tissue oxygenation and prevent organ damage. In patients with shock fluid resuscitation is typically initiated in the pre-hospital setting and continued in the emergency department. The type of fluid used for resuscitation can vary depending on the type of shock and the patient's clinical condition. For hypovolemic shock, which occurs due to a significant loss of blood or fluid, healthcare professionals will typically administer crystalloid solutions, such as normal saline or lactated ringer's solution. These solutions are isotonic, meaning they have a similar concentration of electrolytes as blood, and can help restore blood volume and improve tissue perfusion. For distributive shock, such as septic shock, healthcare professionals may use a combination of crystalloid solutions and vasopressor medications to improve blood pressure and tissue perfusion. Vasopressors are medications that constrict blood vessels and increase blood pressure. It's important to note that fluid resuscitation in patients with shock must be carefully monitored to prevent fluid overload and potential complications, such as pulmonary edema. Healthcare professionals will monitor the patient's vital signs, urine output, and laboratory values to ensure proper fluid balance. Now, we will be talking about medications used in shock patients, including their mechanism of action and drug doses. Shock is a critical medical condition that requires prompt recognition and treatment, and medications are a crucial component of shock management. So, let's dive in and learn how healthcare professionals use medications in patients in shock. Let's start by discussing the medications used in hypovolemic shock, which occurs due to a significant loss of blood or fluid. Healthcare professionals will typically administer crystalloid solutions, such as normal saline or lactated ringer's solution. These solutions are isotonic, meaning they have a similar concentration of electrolytes as blood, and can help restore blood volume and improve tissue perfusion. The dosing for these solutions varies based on the patient's weight and fluid status. Next, let's discuss the medications used in cardiogenic shock, which occurs due to reduced cardiac function. One example of an ionotropic medication used in cardiogenic shock is dobutamine. Dobutamine is a synthetic catecholamine that increases cardiac contractility, leading to an increase in cardiac output and blood pressure. The recommended dosing for dobutamine is 2 to 20 micrograms per kilogram per minute, with the dose adjusted based on the patient's response. In septic shock, which is caused by a systemic infection, healthcare professionals may use a combination of vasopressor medications and fluid resuscitation to improve blood pressure and tissue perfusion. One common vasopressor used in septic shock is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a medication that constricts blood vessels and increases blood pressure. The recommended dosing for norepinephrine is 0.1 to 1 microgram per kilogram of body weight per minute with the dose adjusted based on the patient's response. Another medication used in septic shock is vasopressin, which is a hormone that regulates blood pressure and water balance in the body. In shock patients, vasopressin is used as a vasopressor to constrict blood vessels and increase blood pressure. The recommended dosing for vasopressin is 0.01 to 0.03 units per minute, with the dose adjusted based on the patient's response. It's important to note that the use of these medications in shock patients must be carefully monitored to prevent potential complications. Healthcare professionals will monitor the patient's vital signs, laboratory values, and cardiac function to ensure proper medication dosing and administration. Shock is a life-threatening condition that can have many underlying causes, and while medications and fluid resuscitation can help stabilize patients, definitive treatment of the underlying cause is necessary for long-term management. So, let's dive in and learn more about how healthcare professionals treat the underlying causes of shock. The first step in treating the underlying cause of shock is identifying the specific type of shock. 
As we've discussed before, there are different types of shock, including hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, and distributive shock. Each type of shock has a unique underlying cause, and healthcare professionals will use various diagnostic tools and tests to determine the underlying cause. Once the underlying cause of shock is identified, healthcare professionals can begin definitive treatment. For example, in hypovolemic shock caused by significant blood loss, the definitive treatment would be to stop the bleeding and restore blood volume through transfusion or surgery. In cardiogenic shock caused by a heart attack, the definitive treatment would be to restore blood flow to the affected area of the heart through medication or angioplasty. In obstructive shock caused by a blockage of blood flow, such as a pulmonary embolism, the definitive treatment would be to remove the blockage through medications, catheter-based interventions, or surgery. And in distributive shock caused by sepsis or anaphylaxis, the definitive treatment would be to treat the underlying infection or allergic reaction through antibiotics, antihistamines, or other appropriate medications. It's important to note that definitive treatment for the underlying cause of shock may not always be possible in all cases. For example, in cases of irreversible brain damage, definitive treatment may not be an option. In these cases, healthcare professionals will focus on providing comfort measures and palliative care to ensure the patient's comfort and dignity. Thanks for watching. Please watch our last video on types of shock and causes with pathophysiology in detail. And do not forget to subscribe to our channel for more educational content. Thank you.